Welcome to Uncommons. I'm your host, Nate Erskine-Smith. In the face of opposition from legal scholars, animal rights advocates, and associations of journalists, Ontario has now passed unconstitutional ag-gag laws, an attempt to silence whistleblowers who expose animal cruelty. On this episode, I'm joined by animal justice lawyer Camille Labchuk and University of Alberta law professor Peter Sankoff to discuss the new Ontario law and efforts across the country to hide animal cruelty on farms. They also have their own podcast, Paw and Order, which I encourage you to check out. But before we get to Camille and Peter, I first want to recognize the advocacy and passion of Reagan Russell, who was fatally hit by a pig transport truck while peacefully protesting the new ag ag laws outside of a slaughterhouse. In the words of Toronto Pig Save, of which she was a member, she always did activism with kindness in her heart. We need more people like Reagan in the world, those who dedicate so much of their lives to the pursuit of justice for others. She put herself in harm's way to help animals in distress, and it is hard to accept that she lost her life bearing witness to animal cruelty mere days after our provincial legislature moved to make such activism criminal. Peter and Camille, thanks for joining me. Good to be here. Camille, what is Bill 156? Bill 156 is what's commonly known as egg gag legislation, and that's a term first coined by Mark Bittman of the New York Times after these laws started popping up in the United States. And so what they're designed to do is shut off undercover videos showing up from factory farms and make sure that people don't have the ability to expose hidden animal cruelty. So Ontario's Bill 156 does a couple of disturbing things. It was passed at the behest of the farming industry uh, because they're concerned about the amount of animal advocacy happening around farms, about the fact that people are talking about the conditions that animals are kept in. And it um, kind of targets a few main areas. So the government describes it as being about trespass and stopping trespassers from coming onto farms. But I don't think that's actually what it's about because Ontario already has trespass laws and they're some of the highest penalties in the country. What the bill really does is it targets undercover whistleblowers, so people who might be employees of the facility who got a job there, maybe for the purpose of exposing animal cruelty. It could also target people who've just been working at a farm or a slaughterhouse for years, but one day they see something so troubling that they feel they have to report it and expose it to the media. Um, So it shuts off whistleblower speech, which is pretty troubling. And then it targets people who do activism outside of slaughterhouses. So there's an organization called the Save Movement. And those folks go to slaughterhouses, like many in Ontario. Uh, Fearman's Pork in Burlington, Ontario, that's a pig slaughterhouse. They kill about 10,000 pigs a day. And activists go outside there and they greet pigs in the transport trucks showing up to those slaughterhouses in their final moments. They offer them water if it's a really hot day. They uh, take videos and film um, illegal conditions sometimes, and they expose what those pigs are going through. And the bill targets that type of uh, activity as well. So it says you can't interfere or interact with an animal on a transport truck. So we believe it's uh, pretty troubling and certainly unconstitutional. And it's frustrating and troubling in a couple of different ways. First, that these are stories that are in the public interest and that Canadians, when they see them, are outraged by when that, this kind of cruelty is uncovered. And so to hide that kind of cruelty can't possibly be acceptable in our society. Uh, but two, it, we see this isn't the only piece of legislation in Canada that has now been passed. So we see in Alberta, they were the first province in our country to pass ag ag legislation, and now Ontario has done it. And there's this now concern that it may well be a growing movement. Peter, what's the status of the law in Alberta now? So the Alberta law is, uh, is it's very different in the sense that it's um, it's it was done in a very clever way. It wasn't done like the uh, the Ontario law that targets farms specifically. What they did was they made significant amendments to the Trespass Act, and in the process of doing that, what they did was they bumped up. Uh, penalties for trespass to just a a really significant, almost staggering amount. It was clear that this came in light of some incursions on farms. In fact, that was the stated purpose for doing it. There had been a couple of very peaceful, but nonetheless for farmers, um, irritating incursions where during the daylight hours, a couple of protesters came in and took possession of a farm and had to be removed by police. And the idea was that the Trespass Act was the way to resolve this, and they bumped up penalties 
penalties to a, a staggering degree um, in, the, in, the, in the Trespass Act. And they put in a lot of other measures that were designed to deter these types of actions specifically. So what I mean by that is unusually for a trespass act that is designed to essentially rectify incursions on someone's property, they went after the corporate or organizational entities in a way that's just stunning. So essentially it, it really is targeting essentially advocates who may trespass on farms by putting in penalties for organizations, directors, um, anybody who's involved with this in a way that would essentially bankrupt those organizations. So the deterrence factor was designed to be very, very heavy. Don't do this because we will come after you with guns blazing. Um, and of course, the ag, ag component was the same. And again, it's ostensibly content neutral in the fact that it doesn't go after farms like the way the Ontario law does, but they have the same odious sections that go after any trespass that occurs by false pretense. And that's really the most obvious ag-gag type portion of this bill in the sense that now, again, when anybody goes in undercover, so we're not talking about the more overt sort of, we are going onto your land. Those are trespasses in the ordinary sense. They add this false pretense section, which has real concern because in, in theory, we don't want anybody on our property who's lying to get on there. But that's what undercover investigations are. That's essentially what undercover investigations are. You essentially, you make a representation that I'm coming to work here, nothing else. And, you know, if, if these employers or farms are smart, they'll start putting in very detailed lists of, you know, in the application, what are you doing here? Do you swear to keep this confidential? Are you promising that will eliminate undercover investigations in any sector? So if I were to go in and say, I'd like a job and I really work for a paper and then I, you know, take out my phone and I'm capturing video of, and I've seen video like this of other employees on these farms, smashing, stomping chickens, whipping them against walls, if I capture that and then post it online, I would be violating these but laws. I just want to be careful because I don't want to overstate the law. They would have to ask you first, right? So essentially, you have to gain access by false pretense. So if there's no, my view is if you haven't said anything to gain access by false pretense, you haven't violated the law. But that's just a technicality because essentially what's going to happen is the, the applications will, will include these things. That's the idea is that it will be any, any misrepresentation that gains you access, such as your prior work history, if you list your prior work history and you don't put these things in, I think you're more, more likely than not to be covered by that. And more, more alarmingly, so is the newspaper. That's the problem. Like they'll go after, they, they have the potential that the newspaper or any media organization that has sanctioned this or advocated it is part of the trespass and subject to these penalties. So we already have trespassing laws on the books. And we see this ag-gag movement in the United States. We see these, these laws struck down as unconstitutional in the United States. Why do you think there's such a movement now in Canada to pass these laws and to go at the animal rights movement? Well, I think the answer to that is that the farming lobby in Canada is immensely powerful. In Ottawa, and I'm sure you know this better than I do, Nathaniel, the dairy farmers <laughs> are often referred to as Canada's equivalent of the NRA because they are everywhere, they are having meetings, they are lobbying pretty fiercely to protect their interests. And I think what we've seen in Ontario and in Alberta and other provinces where egg gig is being proposed is the farm lobby going to politicians and saying, you need to protect our interests. And uh, politicians largely want to please that lobby, especially individuals who've got seats in rural ridings. Uh, you, you'll correct me as to the organization itself, but there were there were some of the lobby groups that attended and testified on Bill 156 that said incredibly that animals don't think and feel. That was one of the most shocking things to emerge. Uh, so yeah, as you know, the other week there was testimony before the committee studying Bill 156, and it was the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. They filed a written brief with the committee that said that there's no scientific consensus on whether animals are sentient and what that even means. And they disputed the very idea that animals can feel pain or, or think for themselves, which is just so completely out of step with science that uh, renowned biologist and animal behaviorist from the States, Dr. Mark Beckoff, he heard about this and he wrote about it in Psychology Today. Uh, and, you know, this is an organization, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, that the government actually quoted in its press release when it was announcing that Bill 156 had finally passed. So you see how tight the government is with these animal 
um, industries and the types of people who deny even the very existence of science in terms of animal sentience. So the science is clear enough. I, I also thought our laws recognize, and there's, you know, there are judgments where our, even all the way up to the Supreme Court, where judges are recognizing that animals think and feel. I, I struggle with when we see a statement from an organization that holds itself out as credible as the Ontario uh, Federation of Agriculture would be so offside with the science, but also with our legal system as well. I'm struggling to say I'm surprised only because I've seen similar types of statements made and all sorts of documents. I mean, and let, let me be clear, I, I don't want to, it, it's not even fair to, you know, assign that comment from that group to every farmer. I, I wouldn't want to do that. I don't think that's right. I think there are a lot of other groups that would not share that sentiment. I, at least I hope, I hope there are a lot of other groups that would not share that sentiment. But yeah, it is, it is, it is surprising. Well, many individual farmers, I don't think would share that sentiment either. I, I always remember when I had introduced uh, Bill C-246, I, there was one provision in there that was previously part of Urban Cutler's legislation, previously part of Van McClellan's legislation, previously part of Martin Cochon's legislation when they were justice ministers, but it said it would make it a crime where someone brutally or viciously killed an animal, regardless of whether the animal died immediately. And there was such great misinformation about that. And then when I would speak to individual farmers, because my father-in-law uh, is a farmer himself and has family and friends in the Kamlaki community who are farmers as well. He, my father-in-law is not, uh, he doesn't have animals. He's got cash crop, but uh, speaking to chicken farmers in the area, they said, you know, I'm reading in my local magazine, farmer's magazines, that your bill is going to be terrible for us. Why is it such a problem? And I explained, oh, there's this provision that would make it a crime to brutally and viciously kill an animal, regardless of whether the animal dies immediately. And I started to explain the history of it, where you know a dog was killed with a baseball bat, died immediately, and, and the man was acquitted. And he said, whoa, 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 why would anyone want to kill an animal brutally and viciously? Mm. And so I do think there's a, not only are these lobby groups out of step with Canadian society in many respects, they're also out of step with their own members at, at, at times as well. I think that's totally right. I think that even what I've seen from the farm community and even what uh, provincial representatives have told us based on their meetings with the farm community is the lobby groups are really pushing egg, egg laws and they want to see false pretenses included in that and they want to shut down investigations and undercover exposés. But when you actually explain that to individual farmers, that's not at all what they think that these bills do. They've been communicated uh, to in terms of these are trespass laws. And so of course they oppose trespass on their property but most of them don't really appreciate just how far these laws extend. And can I add a point on that? Because this is sometimes, I, I think this is sometimes overlooked in the debate, although I know we've made these comments before. You can take different views on, on, on trespass, leaving aside the false pretense stuff, which I think is absolutely outrageous. But let's leave aside false pretense for a moment. Okay, let's just say, let's assume that's not in the bill. You, you can have reasonable disagreements about trespass. And I think there that like having trespass laws is, is a good idea. I don't think, you know, I, I don't want people trespassing on my house either freely like I get the idea that trespass gets in but what, what bothers me and what sometimes gets left out of this equation is that these trespass laws are going in for specific purposes and I would have less issue with trespass laws if we had a robust system of investigation on these farms. Like that is the issue. It's like they, it's not, these two issues don't work in isolation. In one sense, they're like, well, nobody should come on our farms because nobody should come on our farms. And I'm like, that's the problem. Like that is the issue. The fact that every major, every, sorry, just about every, I take out there, there was Maple Lodge, which was done by government investigators. So I have to, I can't say every, but just about every major investigation that has taken place in this country involving farm abuse has become as a result of trespass, all of them. Like that's, you know, trespass in one of those two types, false pretense or otherwise. And is it because our laws are insufficient or because the CFIA isn't adequately resourced to do its job or just isn't aggressive enough in doing its oh job? Oh boy, now you're now that's a big kettle of fish. I'll let Camille take the first part of that one, but that's, <laughs> that's a huge question. It, it's all of the above is the answer, right? Yeah, definitely, it's all those things. So I would say the reason that activists are trespassing onto farms in the first place is because they are fed up. They're really frustrated with the fact that Canada does not regulate animal welfare on farms. There's no federal rules, there's no provincial rules about how much space animals should have, what kind of social opportunities they get, um, fresh air, sunlight, anything like that. So in reality, they're crowded into these dark windowless warehouses where the laws like almost don't really apply. 
animals on farms are largely exempted from provincial animal cruelty laws because generally accepted practices that farmers engage in are exempt from the usual laws against causing distress. So you've got the public looking at the situation. They see no laws, they see no inspections, they see no proactive public disclosure about the conditions that we're confining millions of animals in. And it's no wonder that people are taking the matters into their own hands. And so I think without addressing that very serious root issue, I don't think that either of these bills is going to be successful in reducing trespass on farms because people are so fed up. And, and just to address the question you asked specifically, I mean, Camille's addressed part of it in terms of the law, and I, and I totally agree. Um, just to address the issue of inspections, like, the CFIA only has jurisdiction to begin with in, in respect to certain matters involving slaughter and transport. And then we could get into the extent to which the CFIA is A, under-resourced, or B, not directed to really address these violations as a prime part of its mandate, and C, they make systemic decisions within, within, within the confines of the CFIA about what is a violation of these rules that I think are troublesome. So you get to the issue of, in addition to the laws are substandard because they don't allow for these sorts of monitoring, there is no monitoring. I mean, that's the biggest issue. And the industry say, well, there's self-monitoring and industry monitoring through regulation. But there is, there is no independent agency monitoring any aspect of what takes place on farms aside from transport and slaughter. That's it. So insufficient accountability, uh, insufficient oversight and transparency. And insufficient law. The, the, the problems run deep. And, and, to, and then to add to it, we also see in the case of transporting animals, we see there was a federal court of appeal case that did uphold a fine for the cruelty towards animals, or, or I would say failure to prevent harm to animals in the course of transporting thousands of chickens in very cold and inhumane conditions. And it was a slap on the wrist, right? So you have this, these ag gag laws that are deciding to really go at individuals who want to expose harm, but for the companies that are profiting from harm, the fines where they do step over the line and they are caught and they are then taken to task, it is a slap on the wrist and, and cruelty becomes a, a very small cost of doing business. That's exactly it. They just build those fines into their bottom line and they know that they're still going to profit uh, with a baseline level of cruelty. I mean, the Maple Lodge saga in itself is a, is just like, it's an incredible case study for what goes wrong in these areas. I mean, cost of doing business puts it mildly. And then when the government, you know, Maple Lodge, I could be wrong and Camille will correct me, I, I think it's the only situation in which the government said, okay, well, like, <laughs> They've been ignoring this for years, like we've got to take them to task and then they go to trial and it's like, of course, the, the, the industry is going to defend that trial and put, you know, stretch the CFIA resource budget to the hilt because it was like this 20 day trial. It went on forever. And then and then right after the trial, the breaches start happening again like right away. So it's just like, we're back to this. So do we charge them again? There's no imprisonment for breaches of the Health of Animals Act. You know, unless unless the government's eventually going to come after them and start charging them with more, with cruelty, frankly, is really the only way this is going to happen. Charge the charge the organization with, with cruelty under the criminal code. And that's going to be a tough ask. So like the whole structure is sort of allows for this sort of stuff to keep repeating. And I'll just add that Maple Lodge Farms, not long after that court case where they were convicted of all those animal transport violations, I mean, they continued to get infraction notices from the CFIA. All the time. All the time. They had one of the worst records in the country, to my knowledge. And then Mercy for Animals actually had somebody working at that slaughterhouse, which kills half a million chickens a day. And, um, you know, again, that person exposed horrific cruelty, uh, you know, birds arriving frozen solid as ice pucks, birds with their throats slit open while they're still conscious. And uh, the company was still on probation. And to my knowledge, there wasn't even any action taken in relation to that um, breach of probation, that probable breach of probation. I saw, uh, you mentioned uncovering cruelty by way of video. It was sent to me, a slaughterhouse in Toronto and cows alive hanging upside down and their throats slit poorly such that they bled out and they were clearly in agony and crying out and a very slow, painful death. And I raise it with the Minister of Agriculture's office to say, can the CF, CFIA do something about this? And it came back that re religious slaughter being protected, cruelty, cruelty is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cruelty is just the cost of, uh, 
everyone's chief meat. And that's an interesting case too. You're referring to the writhing Regency slaughterhouse. And basically, so far as I can tell, some activists managed to get a camera up by a window and were able to see on the kill floor and got that footage. Um, so that was submitted and no legal action was taken. But the slaughterhouse was later shut down. It actually had its license pulled because of E. coli contamination. So it's not like governments won't act when they feel like there's a compelling enough reason to do so, but for them, animal cruelty is not. And when we talk about rights protection, so religious slaughter protected, is freedom of speech protected though? So when we look at the ag gag laws, there's a constitutional challenge here. When we looked at Bill 156, experts testified, obviously animal advocates like yourself, Camille, testified, but we also saw legal experts testify as to its unconstitutionality. And can you walk me through why it is unconstitutional and, and it, I assume it's a it's a section 2b argument. That's right so section 2b protects our freedom of expression and in a situation where you're telling somebody what they can or cannot say via the false pretenses provision or via a provision like the the, the section that's designed to capture people doing activism outside slaughter trucks that says it's an offense to interfere or interact with an animal the term interact is so broad that it's impossible to know what that means. Does that mean taking a photo of a pig on a, a hot day when the pig is suffering? Does that mean offering water to that animal? Probably. Does that mean um, standing there and speaking with the animal? It very well could. So in multiple ways, this legislation interferes with people's freedom of expression, which in Canada it protects not only the right to convey information to others, but the right of listeners to receive information. And I think that's important because anyone who consumes animal products in this country or anyone who doesn't but still cares about the way animals are treated, they have a right to receive information that's accurate and relevant to the consumer choices that they want to make about whether they want to buy certain products or not. So, you know, I think that was pointed out very clearly to the government. Um, a letter signed by over 40 uh, legal experts pointed this out to them back in February. We saw the uh, CCLA provide testimony, the Canadian Association of Journalists, Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, and uh, it's inevitable at this point that the bill will be challenged. And the law in Alberta, you said, is more cleverly drafted, Peter. Is it open to the same challenges, though? I, I think so, because the, the breadth of the law is actually wider. That's the difference. They're, they're just completely different challenges. Remember that the Alberta Trespass Act, like the coalition that should come together, challenge this law should be very broad and will include, I think, members of the media and the press, because like, remember, it applies to everything. It's not farms, it's everything. Literally, uh, I think there's an article that came out or is coming out in the Globe and Mail that's looking at what would happen today if somebody tried to you know, investigate a long-term care facility in Alberta. It would be very difficult because those are detailed job applications. Like for someone to go undercover as a volunteer or as a, an employee at a long -ter term care facility would be almost impossible because like, again, the newspaper is putting itself at risk financially. The, the, the penalties are like $200,000 maximum fine for the organization. And anybody on the board of directors who's aware of it is also liable. It's, it's like it, they're going after the organization. And that to me is very, very troublesome law. And, and I think that's what makes it vulnerable is that aspect of it. Well, it seems not only that it is completely disproportionate and it could fall on those grounds, but when it comes to freedom of expression, this isn't uh, on the, uh, the lesser protected kind of speech. We're talking about political speech and social activism, adding to the public interest, exposing matters that are certainly in the public interest uh, as a matter of journalistic uh, content. So while we don't have the same First Amendment rules that the U.S. has, and, and so those laws have fairly straightforwardly been struck down, it still seems like a pretty straightforward case here in Canada. I think it is, and I think you're right. This is some of the highest value speech that we have in society. It's promoting a truth-seeking function. It's exposing accurate information to the public about an important issue. And I think additionally that, especially in Ontario, the government has described this bill as being about trespass, protecting people's property, but also biosecurity and protecting food safety. And I don't think that there's any rational connection the government can, can claim between um, a provision that shuts down undercover exposés and food safety. Because we're talking about people who go to work, do their jobs, if they see animal cruelty or a workplace safety violation or filthy conditions, they might film that. But that doesn't mean that they're posing any risk to a facility of contaminating food safety. In fact, they're probably increasing food safety by exposing risks to food safety. And should we be concerned about where this goes from here? So obviously passed in Alberta, passed in Ontario, 
There, are, I know there's a private members bill at the federal level, although I would be shocked if our liberal government at the federal level supports it, and I would certainly have great trouble with that. I, I don't expect that to happen. It's from a conservative MP from Alberta. But that you mentioned other provinces, and do you have a sense of the status and where we're at with these kinds of laws going forward? Yeah, I'll give you a little recap. So um, Alberta was first, British Columbia introduced something as well that's more focused on biosecurity and creating a risk to food safety. It's not as troubling in that it doesn't have the same false pretenses provisions. Um, I would say the same thing about John Barlow's federal bill, C205 I think is its name. Uh, it is more focused on biosecurity. It's troubling because it's very, very punitive, but it doesn't have the same uh, provisions that would shut down exposés in that same way. Uh, but we've also got Manitoba talking about doing a bill. They're starting consultations apparently, and we'll perhaps introduce something in the fall. And Quebec has struck a committee for doing that same thing. So these bills are moving forward. They're starting to sweep the country. And I think it's really up to citizens to tell governments that this is unacceptable. And, and I think it should be noted that you referred to the American bills. I just wanted to say that a lot of the American bills that were struck down, they had overt gag provisions. Like they were, you can't reproduce or you can't publish. But I mean, I don't think that's what made them, that's not the only thing that made them unconstitutional. And, and the Canadian governments have been, you know, clever enough not to include, you can't publish anything. Like, again, you look at the Alberta Trespass Act, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, if you didn't know its origin, its history, and look at it carefully, it doesn't look like a traditional ag gag provision. It's just a trespass bill. But it's like you have to dig deep to actually understand A, why it was passed, and B, what's contained in it to actually see that come to the forefront. But again, it's, it's troubling that these things are happening and they're disguised under the view of protecting our property when that's really not what they're about. And you both at Animal Justice are not only in the business of public animal advocacy, but also taking animal issues to court. And you are, I expect, going to mount a constitutional challenge. And what does the timeline for that look like? Yes, we do plan. We, we think the stakes are, are far too high to let this unconstitutional legislation stand, both for freedom of expression and uh, animals, but also for worker safety and food safety issues. So Ontario's bill received royal assent, but it's not coming into force until the government creates regulations. So this was interesting, actually. I think at the committee, when they got really hammered by all the legal experts who told them it was unconstitutional, they tried to walk it back a little bit. So now they're going to prescribe for the false pretenses provision, um, circumstances and reasons for the applicability of that provision. Uh, and they're going to do the same thing for the provision about interacting with animals on trucks. So once they create those regulations, the bill will come into force, and at that point, we'll be able to challenge it. Although, of course, as you know, challenging things in Canada, it can sometimes take a little time. You don't just always get to challenge everything that you want. Like, it doesn't, the courts are a little bit resistant to letting everybody go in the courts and just challenge. They sometimes want a factual scenario before they actually do that. So it may, it may take a little more time just before we actually get one of those facts on the ground in order to challenge it. But that's certainly the objective. It might take Jenny McQueen doing her job. Well, it might take anybody doing their job. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just like, it, it, that, that is actually a frustrating aspect of Canadian law I won't get into, but it is, it is the law chills immediately. Like the day it goes into force, it chills. But like you can't actually attack it right away until like somebody's affected by it or, or you can at least show that somebody might be. So it's, yeah, it's challenging. You, you make a good point, Camille, when you mentioned protection of workers at the same time. We obviously see with these large slaughterhouses and processing facilities, great exploitation of animals, but also exploitation of migrant labor. And we've seen they don't put standards in place to make sure animals are treated humanely, but nor do they put standards in place to ensure that their workers are treated humanely either. And it's a failure of all levels of government, I think. When it came to your advocacy with Bill 156, obviously this is a conservative initiative I did note, though, you tweeted to say it was a, it was a conservative and liberal supported. I went to look at the list and I was surprised, I got to say, it was of the eight sitting liberal members of parliament, three supported, five were missing in action. Did you, and obviously the NDP and the Green Party member opposed it, although I don't know if, what the full numbers were of, of attendance there. Did you engage with the different parties and have a sense of what their positions were? Yeah, well, we did. We, we we tried to provide them with information about why the bill was unconstitutional. I would say we had less contact with the Liberals, I think, but they've been pretty focused recently on the leadership race. Sure. So that might explain it. I, I will have to take it up with them because it was frustrating to see 
that the caucus that voted, the three of them, that they, they all supported the bill. Well, I appreciate uh, both of you for, for joining me, and I appreciate your advocacy on this issue and animal issues in general. And thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Same to you, Nate. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Uncommons. If you want to support the efforts of animal justice to strike down these unconstitutional laws, donate at animaljustice.ca. Remember uncommons.ca to subscribe for future episodes, and please leave us a positive review on iTunes or your platform of choice.